So my title is Navigating Evidence-Based Cancer Care and Limited Resources in Africa. I've been warned not to talk for too long. So um, translating what the literature says that not compromise evidence-based medicine, the available data is just a component. And most of our previous speakers have actually said that. Um, we have to do it in context. Uh, but it also should cut across the whole cancer continuum, starting with prioritization in areas based on your data from your registries. So that's why I like what the previous speaker said about getting your own data, and that should tailor what you do in terms of your cancer control. But we know we have a lot of infrastructural gaps in Africa. The more reason why we should tailor the recommendations in treating our cancer patients. So for Sub-Saharan Africa, we have common grounds on beliefs and attitudes to life. If you travel across many parts of Africa, we are almost the same, it's very interesting. Um, the yellow cans, um, the selling of water in the containers, it's very common, and our general attitudes to life. All of you have that experience. And we have many other compounding problems other than cancer. So it's difficult to sometimes convince our governments to invest a lot of money. Most countries, East Africa is actually quite lucky that your governments are serious. Most of us actually struggle to get our, our governments to invest in cancer. Um, even in high income countries, value is a priority because cancer is one of the most, um, is the, one of the most common causes of bankruptcy, even in high, because you still have to pay something out of your pocket and we all forget that. We need to minimize waste and maximize benefits. And this is what drives successful implementation of universal health care. So what are the expected outcomes of evidence-based care? You, you improve the safety of your patient because works in your system with the least um, detriments. It's patient-centered, you have discussion, that's where the culture also comes in. Based on what you know about the culture, you know how to uh, package your messages and on, on diagnosis, prevention, and even treatment and survivorship. And we also choose the most effective treatments based on what you see and what you publish and um, comparing to the data out there. And um, it needs to be tailored to improve acceptability. So we all know we have problems with mastectomies in African countries. So you need to package this message kindly and uh, nicely and also the impact and why they should have a mastectomy or not. But you still need to respect what the patient decides. The whole idea of evidence-based medicine is to improve outcomes. So you can tell this patient that you have a 50% chance of recurrence without a mastectomy versus a 5% chance of recurrence with, I think if we package it nicely with so many other things, it, it, it works that way. So the whole idea of uh, um, evidence-based medicine, generating the evidence, you also create like a feedback loop. Um, you regularly evaluate the data collection and research. This is a significant part of evidence-based medicine. You need to undergo peer review and quali develop quality indicators of what works and what doesn't work. And you have a structured feedback. Um, and the process for implementing this, the, the, the changes. It would help to develop a stronger health system and improve patient outcomes. So it's not a one, one slot thing. It has to be multidisciplinary um, for it to be successful. So what is the current status of evidence-based um, oncology right now? Most of the evidence, unfortunately, is generated in the high-income countries. So their areas of interest are dependent on their priorities and depending on the agency as well that is helping you to produce these guidelines. We have a lot of drug companies that support the development of guidelines, but sometimes the agenda is just to push their drugs into the guidelines, so you need to be aware of some of these things. Um, the disease burdens may be totally different, so they are not interested. Most of the high, uh, for example, cervical cancer, um, the high-income countries don't have that much of cervical cancer, except like in the, uh, the low-income groups of, pay, of people. But for us, it's the number two, in most places even number one. So ideally, we should be generating the evidence for managing cervical cancer, but actually it's the other way around. And I hope this will change as we improve our oncology services on the continent. Um, a lot of research that is so-called research to support this evidence is actually based on surrogates 
endpoints. So they are not real endpoints. They don't wait for the, 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 the studies to mature anymore. And they are just from calculations and from modeling, this is likely to cause this reduction in outcomes. So we don't have real world data and people are looking more of that. And these are things that we can generate, even though we cannot, maybe we are not fit, or I would say we are not strong enough to develop our own trials. These are things that we could, implementation research, so many things can come out of this. Also, most of these trials do not include populations like us. And uh, also, most of them are, I said, like um, sponsored by uh, industries, and therefore there's some rivalry, you know, and all kinds of things in these, and the trials are not very well um, designed. So there's a lot of lack of data of trials from low to middle income countries. So it's difficult for us to have impactful guidelines because we can't inform the processes. And most new therapies that we have in these new guidelines actually run down our budgets. So we can't even go back to the government because they haven't been able to, they haven't been able to get back the money that was put into the system, and it increases the healthcare burden. So what are the three main components of evidence-based practice? Utilize the best external evidence. This is not a slide from Africa, it's from a high-income country. Draw on individual clinical experience and consider values and expectations. I've circled the first one because most of our tend to, depend, to think that that is what determines evidence base. It's just one of the components. The data is just one of the, you have to add your clinical expertise and your patient value and expectation, even just the society as well, not just that. So how do we generate, integrate evidence into our practice efficiently? So how can we rely on the current evidence available to implement uh, um, uh, evidence-based medicine in low to middle income countries? Do we need to develop our own evidence? That's the big question. Is shared decision making so important? Is the clinical expertise vital? Is the workforce ready to adopt the evidence-based medicine? These are things that we need to ask ourselves. So just not adopt what we have from out there, but how does it fit into your current system? Again, and how can you make it better? So what are the gaps to generating high quality research in, in low to middle income countries? We have a poor research culture. We have a high patient burden per doctor. And I think this is changing as we show that now we have more oncologists on the continent, but still not enough to satisfy our needs. As um, the last presenter showed, I think 23 oncologists, but only three doing a PhD. That person is very brave. I think I'll do that when I retire, PhD. I, f I find it very <laughs> intimidating, but that is excellent. But I think we need more than three. So we need to drive more research. We have poor technological advancements. We have poor data recording. That is a cultural problem, I don't know. Insufficient funds. Um, we have absence of research-friendly governments and institutional policies. So it's difficult to do research from the institutions where we belong. And then we also have unbalanced predatory global collaborative research. So the collaborative research so far is only geared towards the outcomes are geared towards your funder, not really your interests. So these are things that are coming up and people are talking about it quite a lot. So this is a, a paper that um, was published in 2017 from Ethiopia looking about how evidence-based um, practice is adopted by healthcare providers. And you could see that one of the highest problems was with the hospital infrastructure, such as computers, internet, and new treatment guidelines are not adequate for implementation of um, evidence-based guidelines. That was number one. And then we also have lack of training. Lack of training about evidence-based practice makes it difficult to implement. So we have so many I'm not going to go each and all, all of them. Lack of organized patient education department makes it difficult to incorporate the patient preferences into practice. So we have all these 110 reasons why we don't adopt evidence. But I know that this is changing over time. But the first thing is to be aware of it and know what you can do to make this better. And this resonates in many studies in different parts of Africa on the same topic, that we don't seem to be ready. But I think this has to be changed. Now, should we talk about resource stratified care? There's a lot of pluses and minuses, but I am a, a, a promoter of resource stratified guidelines because one size doesn't fit all. The cultures are different and so many other things. So it's not possible to have this done. Access. So we have all these beautiful drugs and all these guidelines. So somebody from externally comes to help you to put in your guideline but insists 
that you have to put something in your guideline, which you know. For a typical example, in my country, in Ghana, we are better than, but a few years ago, you, you couldn't, when you did new adjuvant chemotherapy for a patient and she has complete response, what happens in Tanzania? I don't know, but for us, the patient is gone because it's gone away. Tell me why she should come and have a mastectomy when the cancer is gone. So most of my physicians do not like doing new adjuvants. So after three cycles, they do the surgery. While the tumor is still there, the patient psychologically understands that. But tell me how a woman will, will accept a mastectomy for a tumor that is no, no, no longer there. Apart from the fact that maybe we didn't educate her properly, but probably even me with a so-called high degree might probably end up being the same. It's culture, it's in our DNA. So a lot of things have to actually be done to you know, change these things. Now cost effectiveness. So we just write the drug because that is the latest thing to do. But then how much, what does it do to this patient? Is it affordable? Is it sustainable? Because there's no point in writing a, an expensive drug because the patient will not buy the drug. They will not take the drug and therefore the patient will fail and you didn't lose. Versus a cheaper drug that would probably be easier to adapt and to sustain. So these are the things that, why we think that we should have our own guidelines. Look at equity should be looked at in the lens of economies of scale. So we all talk about disparities of care, but it also depends on the economy and how it, has, it can be sustained and balanced. We need to define the minimum standards based on realistic expectations. So you want to give Herceptin and Pegeta to all your um, metastatic uh, um, breast CAs or even as adjuvant therapy, but is it sustainable? Have we even done the math with the Herceptin? We haven't, let alone add Pegeta. And how many women can get that? And these are things that we have to discuss. There's evidence that six months might be worked out for early stage, but we are all adopting one year because that is what the drug companies told us. This is what the evidence is, but these are things to look at. Workforce strengths. We are now training um, nursing oncologists in our countries. We didn't have them before. So could they actually um, help to, to, to make evidence-based care what it's supposed to do? We have just general nurses who do a lot of things. So there are a lot of things going on that will make us think about doing these resource stratified guidelines for ourselves. We might not always have the most updated information on the subject, and that tends to upset a lot of people. But that is what we know works in our, our countries, and that is what we do. But again, are they going to be crafted by experts from high-income country, or with us being the leaders of the resource stratified guidelines? And usually that is what the issue is. We had a picture of a, a, a presentation at the NCCN resource track. That is what everybody says. Why are you allowing people to tell you what to do? I said, no. We are telling people what we want to do, and that is the difference with the NCCN. And these are the kind of things that we need to go forward with. What is the current state of resource transfer guidelines for South? I might miss some, but we have the Global Health, um, Breast Health Global Initiative. That was one of the first resource transfer guidelines. The African Cancer Coalition, the name was changed from American Cancer Society to African Cancer Coalition, and rightly so, because it's driven by Africans. Then we have the ASCO Resource Stratified Guidelines, not just for Africa, but for different parts of the world. And we have our own regional and local guidelines, and so many others. So that is where we are. So all countries, it should be part of the National Cancer Control Planning to develop your own guidelines. So what is missing in the current resource stratified? I've said most of them already. We don't have any implementation research. We just adopt these guidelines. We don't do research by replicating them in our countries, come up with the data with what works and what doesn't work. We adapt evidence. We don't have evidence blocks to show that this works in our country or not. We don't, the leadership must be the end users, but rather other people who are in politics or in government administrators are the one who guide the processes of the resource transfer guidelines. And I think this is also not right. We should be the leaders of these, development of these guidelines. And it has to be accepted by the local government, and it has to be updated by the local expertise. In one of my surveys, I realized that the local um, oncologists actually use guidelines mostly from NCCN, not the resource stratified, not the one from Africa, but the original high income guideline and the ISMO guidelines. Nothing wrong with that. The reasons could be that just because they were not involved in developing their own local guidelines. So, and they didn't even agree with what was in there because it didn't really add up. So these are the things that are missing in, in our guideline. And then we don't have any patient reported outcomes. So we, the patient-centeredness is the new thing in oncology. 
the patient's input is very, very important. But we are missing this in when we are um, developing our guidelines because we don't have the evidence. I think it's something that we need to move into. And then the local guideline developed should be part of the National Cancer Control Plan. So it's a must, and that will guide us towards this. So why is implementation research so critical in, in low to middle income countries? It leads to safety, effectiveness, replicability, and scalability then you can know what to scale up and what not to scale up, and what to change and what not to change. The gaps in recommended cancer interventions will be elucidated with rigorous high quality implementation research and an impetus to innovate, to do something different that will improve outcomes. So let's do a few clinical scenarios. Breast cancer is one of I had a long list, but I was told I talked too much, so I had to cut it down. So I'll cut it down to breast cancer and another cancer. So in terms of early diagnosis, we have to have a culturally sensitive approach. We can't do mammograms. We are not there yet, unfortunately, after all these years. But what does the evidence show? Are these patients going to come back? What is the first one at 40 years or at 50 years? We don't even know yet because most of African women have very big and dense breasts. So are the mammograms even effective at all? Those are some of the issues that you should ask yourself. And what can we do to change this to make it cost effective? There are trials. There was one from Ghana. There was one, the biggest one was from India. And even by doing a mammogram in, in, in clinical examination, you're able to reduce the risk of breast cancer, early detection in patients over 50. But that trial showed that it was more effective in patients over 50 than under 50. We didn't even know that. We just adopted clinical breast examination without realizing that there's a specific age group that actually benefits more than the other. And this should be replicated. This was India, which we replicated in Africa. Our breast densities are totally different. So I think these are things that can be done. Um, how feasible is it to get mammograms? They are all in the districts, mobile units. Nobody knows what is happening there. Um, we should adopt research from other countries like ours. And what is the current rule of genetic testing? So my auntie has breast cancer. My cousin has breast cancer. So what is the role now in genetic testing? Is it feasible? I don't know whether you have it here or not. But most countries, it's not. But can we just do, like, even just psychological, I mean, just counseling? On your mother has breast cancer, your three sisters have breast cancer, so you also have the risk and other cancers. Just that, because they are not going to come and have that treatment or mastectomy, it's not going to happen in our culture. So it's something that you have to realize, so we have to adopt these things. And so it's a little different for us. Staging is mandatory. Every breast cancer patient has to have uh, immunohistochemistry, even if it's not for treatment, to prognosticate your patient and for future use as well. Now, clinical, so but some of us will say it's too expensive, it doesn't change anything, and we still put our patients on tamoxifen, you know, whatever. But then we have to guide, use the guideline, and also your HER2 testing, are you going to use it? What, if the patient is HER3 positive, I don't know what to do. My patients can't afford fish. So it's a very big problem in how we are going to adopt this in terms of our evidence-based guidelines. Clinical exam is still vital. Most of us have ignored clinical exam and use your radiological imaging. But that is actually a way of reducing costs by clinically examining the patient. It's totally different. Appropriate tools should be based on appropriate um, resources. So we all want CT scan, abdomen, pelvis, and whatever, but we know that it's expensive. If you have universal health care, hallelujah. But even that, you should look at the systemic effects in terms of cost on the system. So the fact that it's free doesn't mean that everybody should have a CT scan. So chest x-ray and ultrasound in early stage, but however, when it comes to advanced stage, then you might need to do, you have to use your, your um, ideas. And then patient factors. So you have to consider that the patient has to travel so long to come and do your imaging or can do it in wherever they are to reduce the cost. So these are things that we have to think about. In terms of treatment, multidisciplinary um, approach is standard. How do we do so we can, um, um, COVID taught us a lot, so we can do this via internet to reduce costs of traveling and timing and all that, to be able to adopt this multiple disciplinary, which is actually one of the means of pushing evidence-based medicines, because you have so many disciplines that will say, and we learn a lot as well at this multiple disciplinary team, because most of us don't have surgical oncologists, gynae oncology, we have generalists, and that is how they learn how to implement how these things are done and it helps to promote evidence-based medicine. Levels of evidence, whether we choose level one or level five, we don't do special, um, doctor experience anymore. It's a lot more into the levels of the evidence, but sometimes the evidence is not what we can afford, so then you might have to adopt to something else. The sequencing of treatments, which one comes first? Adjuvant, 
um, surgery first, chemo first, radiotherapy first. There's a lot of guidelines out there. Again, you have to adapt it to your situation. So like I said, in Ghana, most people don't like doing your adjuvant for the reason I'm giving you. But there are so many things that you can look at. Or maybe the, the line for waiting for surgery is three months. So in that case, I'll just start my chemo. Not because the evidence doesn't support that, but that is what, that is what my system has not to delay treatment. So that's how you have to match the evidence with your contextual um, situation. Now, compliance as well. So there are some things the patient might not be able to comply to because they live too long or it's too expensive or the sum out of, we always forget the independent costs, the, sorry, um, um, non-medical costs of treatments. That also actually can be higher than your medical costs. So you need to consider this as well. Managing toxicities, um, patient factors and system factors as well in deciding how you treat your patients. I also go to colorectal cancer. You have this beautiful slide here that shows all the developments in, in colorectal cancer over the years. But um, on the other slide, you can see that even with basic chemotherapy and maybe um, abvastin, you're able to get more than 20, um, um, 20 months of a median survival with metastatic colorectal cancer. And actually, the addition of these new therapies didn't actually add that much. So you should remember that evidence says use Pembro, this, that, that, but remember that the difference is not that much. So you should need to be able to appraise the evidence, adapt it to your situation with your clinical expertise. And if the patient says, I can't afford bevacizumab, don't put it in there. Because the patient goes out of that window and doesn't come back. And that gives um, a very bad impression. They talk, the patients talk to each other. The patients are not going to come to you anymore. And then you can't implement the guidelines that you, you developed. So colorectal cancer is the same levels of evidence for screening. We, are we going to use fecal occult blood tests or sigmoidoscopy? I can't afford a sigmoidoscopy. It's too expensive. It really is, and colonoscopy, they are expensive. So we need to remember all of these things and maybe just go with the uh, uh, fecal occult blood test, the antigen type. It's probably better than if there's a problem, they can go along with that. Standardizing laboratory techniques. So the laboratory reference ranges are different, depends on the lab. And also, what is it for Africa? It might be different. Anemia, I think we accept 10, but other places, 10 is, is anemia. You know, but for us, 10 is average. So, there are, so these are some of the things that we need to look at to develop our guidelines. Effective screening methods, education of the primary care workers will also help to implement the guidelines. And genetic screening, I've said a lot about that. That is not easy. Now, substandard treatment without staging, we have to stage our patients. It's in the evidence, but this is something that we all don't do. We just go up and open up before we realize the patient has lung meds or liver meds. But these are easily adaptations of evidence-based. Molecular profiling is expensive. You need to talk to the patients to see if they can afford the treatments before you go and do all these expensive tests. Okay, and look at the patient and the system as well. Um, use of multidisciplinary approach choice of therapies, molecular profiling, sequencing, patient factors, and local research should guide the best way the patient is treated. So examples of paradoxical situations, um, adjuvant care, we, we start chemo for breast cancer without um, immunohistochemistry. We use targeted therapy outside of molecular biomarker testing. We give multi-agent chemotherapy for patients with metastatic breast cancer, and um, we also don't support um, the total evidence sometimes. In terms of surveillance, for example, for ovarian cancer, we use CA125, which has been shown over and over again not to be beneficial. There's no point in treating a patient with a rising CA125 without any symptoms. It's just as good as waiting for them to develop symptoms, but we cause a lot of anxiety with this. Uh, primary local research for primary local resection for patients with stage four disease. We need to look at that again. Multi-agent chemotherapy, chemotherapy, um, even a patient who has hormone, strong hormone receptor positive disease. In terms of radiotherapy, using a single fraction versus multiple fractions, and then a poor uptake of hypofractionation in our institutions. In terms of diagnosed bone scan in early stage disease, um, without doing treatment, um, talking about treatment outcomes, we start uh, uh, the impact of the diagnosis on the patient. We just go ahead and do our, our tests. And in terms of supportive care, um, we don't use olanzapine that much in uh, anti-emetic therapies, but it's very cheap and very effective. Rather, we want to use very expensive medications, and also uh, we use a lot of blood transfusions in our patients as well, even at towards the end of life. So this is just a slide here discussing everything I, want, I, I said, and looking at the best evidence depends on, um, on the risk-benefit assessment of the intervention, the effectiveness, and the time of the intervention clinical expertise, contextual assessments, clinical appropriateness for where you are, 
and barriers to treatment, you look at all of this, including cultural, individual, and functional, looking at the family values and preferences and the client preference, that together makes you apply your evidence to what the situation is. So what are the factors influencing um, uptake in Africa? Poor assimilation of updated information by the workforce. We need to have regular updates, including critical appraisal courses. There's a lack of local health system research. We have to have intensive to promote these activities. There's a poor skill set among MDT teams. That will take a long time, to, but we are, we are doing better now. We need to promote all cadres of oncology workforce training. We tend to concentrate a lot on the clinical oncologists, but without the surgical oncologists, gynae oncologists, gynae pa um, 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 oncology pathologists, it's actually very difficult to understand what we are trying to do with our patients. Local guidelines are not prioritized. We need to engage the local experts as leaders of guideline development. There's poor visibility of local research. There's a global call for equity in research dissemination. I hope all that we talked about will get into the e-cancer journal about um, the updates on on uh, what we have in Tanzania, I think it's a very good story because nobody knows what's happening in Africa. We are not where we were 10 years ago, and I think we need to tell the story. There are policies lacking, the, uh, guiding the, um, they are lacking policies to guide the code of practice. Oncology is not recognized as a subspeciality. So everybody sees the patient and that's what they want before they hand over. So my little joke is that everybody else is an oncologist except for the clinical oncologist. So they do everything they want to do before they send you the patient. So all the sequencing is wrong, all the therapies are wrong. So we need to have an advocacy to permit good clinical practice and that has to start from the institutions. So thank you very much.